So I've heard that episode 11 is terrible, and I've heard that episode 12 is great. I have no idea what to expect, but uh, let's watch and find out, I guess. Water, earth, fire, air. wind, air. Damn it! The Great Divide. Here it is, guys. The Great Divide. Wow. Is that a metaphor? I didn't know the canyon guy took reservations. That's the ignorance I'd expect from a messy Zhang. So unorganized and ill-prepared for a journey. We'd rather be taken by the Fire Nation than travel with those stinky thieves. We wouldn't travel with you pompous fools anyway. I think what's missing so far is stakes. Like, there's nothing that I really care about. Both the groups, they kind of seem annoying. <laughs> like, I don't want Aang and Asaka and Katara to waste any time here. It kind of reminds me of the movie Klaus, where the two tribes are fighting and you just don't care about them because, like, they're both stupid. Also, is it just me or is this a little bit out of character for Katara and Aang? I kind of feel like the, the this episode started with, like, a message first, and then they just had Aang and Katara and Sokka be mouthpieces for the, for the goal they wanted to reach in the episode without actual consideration for their character. The Great Divide. It just feels kind of like the two sides are just caricatures. They're just cardboard cutouts. There's an idea I've had about this kind of thing that I've been trying to formulate unsuccessfully for a very long time, which is when is something art and when is it just contrived garbage? I really think that art comes from honest exploration of something, where the writer does the characters and events in such a way that it reflects real life very closely in a way you can sink into it as if you're there. And once you're there, you can kind of explore a theme or issue in maybe ways you hadn't explored it before, and that kind of gives you life experience and can deliver a lesson to you about yourself or about the way you see the world. When it fails, usually it's because the person has the message first. They think that this is exactly the way they want you to think. So it stops being an exploration and it starts being kind of like a lecture. Can't we all get along, for example, is just such an oversimplification. Especially because both sides of this are unsympathetic to me. They're just characters that don't agree and fight. It's lonely, isn't it? Being impartial. I wish I could help these people get along. To the death! And let this be the end of this Imagine fight. if we liked these characters, then it would be something. This is actually a really common mistake I see all the time. Action without meaning. Like, it doesn't matter how good the choreography is, if you don't care about the characters or if there's nothing at stake, it's boring. You're all awful! You tell him, Aang. <laughs> That's, that's correct. I never thought a Ganjin could get his hands dirty like that. And I never knew Yu Zhang's were so reliable in a pinch. Perhaps we're not so different Oh, was gonna, damn it, I was gonna say that. Jin Wei? Wei Jin? I know those guys. There seems to be a lot that was of confusion about what happened. So the official put him in the penalty box. Not for 20 long years, but for two short minutes. That was a very unsatisfactory explanation. I made the whole thing up. I'm starving. Okay, all right, I get it. That is like what a kid's show episode would be. Very easy morality, very cardboard characters. It's kind of harsh, it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. But let's get to the storm, which I keep seeing people mention. So it's, it's a dream, I'm guessing. We need you, Aang. Premonition. Be careful, guys! First of all, animated beautifully. That was really nice, especially with the dissolving the dust thing. It's definitely foreshadowing of something bad to come. Also, it's it's a sign of Aang's mounting pressure that he needs to take care of everyone and that everything falls on his shoulders, including a feeling of guilt that maybe he feels not capable of handling it or carrying the burden on his shoulders, which he's started to express recently in past episodes. Then also there is a hint that we're maybe going to learn something about why he vanished for a hundred years. And then at the end, there is a brief flash, I think, of the Fire Lord. So a sign of danger. So very strong opening to the episode. Immediately sets the tone as this is going to be a, a serious one. It's nothing. I just had a bad dream. Go back to sleep. It was quite the dream. You don't have to tell me twice. You guys want to hear about my dream? That's okay. I didn't want to talk about it anyway. Poor Sokka. <laughs> There is a storm coming. Prince Zuko, consider the safety of the crew. Finding the Avatar is far more important than any individual's safety. So there's also actually a real storm coming. I'm sure after a bowl of noodles, it 
everyone will feel much better. Iroh knows what matters. Speaking of heavy burdens to carry, Zuko obviously is carrying the burden of who his father is. I think in a past episode I talked about how you can repeat the mistakes of your parents. It cuts both ways too, because if one of your relatives really made a name for themselves, you're forced to live in, in that shadow. That becomes part of your identity in ways you can't escape. There's your own self-identity and then there's the outside identity of people and, and the way they perceive you collectively. And if you're the son of someone who's done great things, I don't mean good things, but like impressive things or big things, you are kind of doomed to be grouped together with that person. Zuko can never break free of that really. His failures are doubly painful because people expected more of him. And his successes are worth even less because that's just what he's supposed to be because he's a prince. And that's tough because obviously he's someone who's very ambitious. And he wants things that are great. He wants acknowledgement. He wants recognition. Especially from his father, who seems to be incapable of giving it to him. Aang would never turn his back on anyone. Oh, he wouldn't, huh? Then I guess I must have imagined the last hundred years of war and suffering. It's not his fault he disappeared, right Aang? I'm guessing there's something so secret about why he disappeared that doesn't reflect well on Aang, and that maybe there's some guilt that's going to come out of that, and he's going to have to cope with it. I guess that hit him, that hit him badly. I wonder how much Aang knows. He's been having dreams about it, but we don't know exactly what he knows about his disappearance. It's a nice shot. That fisherman was way out of line. Actually, he wasn't. Oh, so he does know something. I was playing with some other kids just outside the south wall. <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs> How do you know it's me? We have known you were the Avatar for some time. Normally, we would have told you of your identity when you turned 16. But there are troubling signs. Storm clouds are gathering. Mm. I fear that war may be upon us, young. So we have the repetition of the clouds thing as a metaphor for like turbulence. We need you, Aang. So notice his face was sunken. I guess that suggests that from the very beginning, he was a little bit overwhelmed by it. It's a nice contrast the way they did that because right before that, he was playing with his friends and he was admired by his peers. And so now he's the avatar. He's kind of this other. And it's like the end of innocence almost. That's the end of playtime. Especially when you're saying like, we need to tell you this because there's a war coming and you are the, the answer to the war. Now we're getting to see a little more backstory on why he's so overwhelmed. Maybe it's also connected to what I was saying about uh, Zuko. When you're chosen like that or when people look to you like that, it kind of like removes your ability somewhat to form your own identity and who you are. Not having a clear path is a burden. The burden is finding your path for yourself out of nothing. But being given a path is also a burden of a kind because you cannot choose anymore. You kind of lose the agency in your own life. I think maybe the only optimal thing would be that you actually want to do the thing that's placed in front of you, that it, it means something to you to pick up the burden others are placing you because maybe those people mean something to you or because you want to define yourself as someone who does that kind of thing, who will pick up the burdens of others. But that's really, really tricky. And another big pitfall of that is it's better not to do it at all than to do it poorly. If you pick up responsibility and you're not good at it, it ends up being disastrous. It's better if you just left it alone. How do you have the confidence to approach this huge obstacle and know you can solve it before you've solved it or before you have any experience solving it? And the knowledge that once you pick it up, once you accept it and you fail, it's going to have severe effects on people around you. This very same people you're trying to protect by picking up this burden. So that's a huge thing to carry on your shoulders to go from childhood innocence playing with balls to you are the savior of the universe, it's a lot. Who does Zuko think he is? Do you really want to know? Cool, so we're, we're kind of looking both at Aang and at Zuko and kind of what made them who they are, what gave them their conflicts, that's great. The more I watch it, the more I, I'm convinced that the writers are setting them up to be kind of parallel characters. They're right now at opposite end of the spectrum, but they probably are more similar than, than we're led to think initially. I want to go into the war chamber, but the guard won't let me pass. If I'm gonna rule this nation one day, don't you think I need to start learning as much as I can? Those soldiers love and defend our nation. How can you betray them? All I knew was that after I found out, everything began changing. <laughs> yeah, I instinctually mentioned the other, otherization of him. I've had that experience in my life where I, I achieved a certain status or milestone and then people started treating me differently. You gotta be careful what you wish for. If you become someone who's revered, you also become 
someone who's unapproachable. People's reactions change to you. Now that you're the Avatar, it's kind of an unfair advantage for whichever team you're on. That's the only fair way. Huh. But I think that in real life it wouldn't manifest that way. That's kind of a weird arbitrary thing to say. What actually would happen in real life if he was the Avatar was they wouldn't treat him as a friend anymore. They would be too busy worshipping him in their own way. Because he would now be on a pedestal above them. And so they would look up to him. And when you look up to someone, you can't play with them. Now who wants to have Jinju on their team? <laughs> Poor Jinju, that was harsh. I hope Jinju has redemption and becomes the strongest. You're playing games with him? The Avatar should be training! Work-life balance. Zuko misunderstood. When he turned to face his opponent, he was surprised to see it was not the general. It was the Fire Lord whom he had disrespected. Mm. Zuko would have to do his own father. All I want is what is best for him. But what we need is what's best for the world. Hmm. I feel like I'm missing something important because uh, they're tell telling both their stories at the same time and they're both about raising children. They're both about raising children into fully functioning, useful people. Both of them are about brutality to raise them up. But I'm not really sure what to make of it beyond that. I feel like there's something there that I'm not seeing. He ran away. <gasps> and he ran away he in the storm. I was waking up in your arms after you found me in the iceberg. Hmm. Feels like there's something missing there. How did he go from being unconscious to being trapped in ice? I feel like there's gonna be more to that story we find out later. And then the Fire Nation attacked our temple. My people needed me and I wasn't there to help. I did turn my back on the world. Well, he also wasn't ready. There's no way he would've been able to do anything. In fact, it almost seems like he probably saved everyone just longer term than if he just had fought and died as like a little kid. Even if you did run away, I think it was meant to be. Yeah, that's what if I said. If you had stayed, you would have been killed along with all the other airbenders. Right, you don't just talking that. sense. You give people hope. You know, that also sets up a nice redemption arc for Aang too. Because he let people down, so now him saving them will be extra sweet. I meant you no disrespect. I am your loyal son. Rise and fight, Prince Zuko. Suffering will be your teacher. I looked away. He was banished. The Avatar gives Zuko hope. It's a nice. That was cool. Nice little sequence there. Look! Oh, wow. Is that an element? What, what was that? So that obviously is contrasts with earlier. He said he didn't care about any individual. He obviously does care. He saved them. The Avatar! What do you want to do, sir? Let him go. We need to get this ship to safety. Oh! First of all, that was the culmination of his his dream, his anxiety dream, but he was able to perform and save everyone. Second, there's the metaphor of the reins. Grabbing the reins, obviously, clear metaphor of, like, control and power. I'm still not really clear about, like, the Avatar powers when he has the blue eyes and stuff like that, what that actually means, and if he's actually in control of that. I'm done dwelling on the past. Really? I can't make guesses about how things would have turned out if I hadn't run away. I'm here now, and I'm going to make the most of it. I don't think you're going to have those nightmares anymore. So that episode was really nice, really well conceived, and very rich. I'm sure I missed a whole bunch of stuff, just because there was like a lot of symbolism in there, and a lot of different narrative elements happening at the same time. I think the most interesting thing for me is the way that they're kind of like running a parallel narrative between Aang and, and Zuko and comparing and contrasting them. Zuko's backstory is quite sad, it's, t it's very touching. The fact that he got those scars from his own father, like mercilessly beating him. The Fire Lord maybe actually was doing it for what he thought was Zuko's best interest, but that's gotta really hurt. I talked about Aang, Aang's perspective changing quickly. Zuko's also, that's a pretty severe <laughs> change. Like one minute he's super pumped to be the successor to the Empire and he wants to be part of it. And he does what he feels like is right. And his punishment for that is his father beating on him and an exile. 
which talk about like a brutal shift in, in your thinking. And I like how, despite the fact that he had that origin, he's still a good kid. And that's really apparent when you compare his external appearance, his external personality, which is like, I'm top and all lives are expendable versus his action, which is saving the crewman when he's in danger and then like diverting the ship to the eye of the storm instead of chasing the avatar. It's like that thing of having good in you that survives evil. This episode definitely provides a really rich feeling of the backstory for Aang and, and Zuko. They're like set up on this path that's gonna, they're gonna intersect. And it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out between them. How much they are able to shoulder the burden and resist the temptation for easy outs and for avoiding the call of power, because that's a thing too. It's funny to do episode 11 and 12 back to back because you have one of the worst episodes so far and then one of the best episodes so far, if not the best episode so far. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you next time for episode 13 and 14.